the environment is what provides uh, a living for us as humans. If the environment's being affected, then undoubtedly uh, the human populations are also being affected. So, so we should be interested in it for its own sake. And then, of course, <clears throat> as most of you know, most medical research is done on non-human systems, on, on plants, animals, even cell lines, sometimes even fish uh, and worms, uh, because we can learn much about ourselves from these other organisms. And so I would argue that learning about the effects on non-human biota in Chernobyl and Fukushima also tells us a lot about, of interest for, our, for ourselves. So I got started in Chernobyl just by accident. I'm an evolutionary biologist by training, geneticist, and uh, I used to work on the genetics of behavior in insects, primarily, <laughs> as something is completely esoteric. And by chance alone, uh, I, I, I was taken to Chernobyl for a, a visit in 1999, and this just turned into a little bit of a hobby uh, to study radiation effects in animal populations. Turned out there was nobody doing really rigorous scientific research on the non-human biota of the region. Uh, and this was a big surprise to me, uh, that there's this you know, big void in our knowledge. And, and it, then, it, then, it, then it became apparent as to why there was very little research being done. And the, the main reason was that there's, there was very little funding for research on non-human systems. And the, the granting agencies were not providing funding. Certainly the International Atomic Energy Agency was not providing funding. And, uh, and, and it became clear why a couple of years after we got started in about 2005, about 10 years ago, the Chernobyl, the International Atomic Energy Agency released its Chernobyl Forum reports. And in this report, uh, apart from suggesting that most of the human diseases were related to stress and not to radiation, they also suggested, they all, and smoking and drinking, uh, they also suggested that the plant and animal life in Chernobyl was thriving, that it was doing wonderfully well, and, and, and they presented no data in support of this, uh, this position. Uh, and, and what little data they did have was from laboratory studies, not from actual studies of animals in Chernobyl. And so, so this motivated us to do uh, a lot more than we had been doing uh, prior to that. Uh, and uh, so we've been there many, many times since 2000. In 2011, July 2011, we started visiting Japan, Fukushima region, to, so that we could repeat our studies, so that we could replicate the same sorts of studies we'd done in Chernobyl in Fukushima. And of course, by replicating the science, you, you get much more uh, information. It's a very strong support for the hypothesis of whatever that might be. So we've uh, published about 90 papers now in the last 10 years related to this topic. Uh, and uh, most of them are available on my website if, if any of them interest you. So, so the first question, the first question if you're an evolutionary biologist, the first question you want to ask is, does the radiation associated with Chernobyl and Fukushima, does this do anything to the DNA? Does it cause genetic mutations? Does it lead to genetic damage of some sort? And uh, there had been some studies of this sort done prior to our work uh, 10 years ago. Uh, and, uh, and we've done a, quite a number of studies along these lines. And every single study that we've done, and every single study that, most of the studies that we've looked at report consequences of, of the radiation for genetic damage. It, it, you, perhaps you can't see this. This is a cover page of a recent publication. It's about a year old. And in this paper, published in Nature's Scientific Reports, we take all of the studies that had ever been done looking at the effects of radiation on genetic damage for Chernobyl systems. Includes some humans in here as well. And the overwhelming conclusion is that in almost every single study, there's a very strong signal of genetic damage related to the radiation exposure. And this is this bar right here. This is a simple, this graph is simpler than it looks. This is the, the bar that signifies a zero effect of radiation. Each one of these little red lines is a single study. And so these are all of the studies that have been done. These studies down here, 
show no effect of radiation. There's a couple over here that seem to imply a positive effect of radiation, just one or two. But the vast majority show very strong negative impacts. This is an extremely strong finding. This, uh, this, this result is, is overwhelming. It's, it, it's absolutely indisputable. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and perhaps not so surprising, right? We've known that radiation causes genetic damage for, for a century, and so it's not so surprising. What's surprising is that the International Atomic Energy Agency and the UNSCAR haven't really done this before. They haven't mentioned this. A lot of this data has been around for at least a decade or longer. This is another, uh, this is a caption from our, one of our most recent papers. This came out just a few weeks ago. And it's, it's really, uh, it, it, again, it's based on similar analysis of the published literature. And it really is just there to cue me to tell you the story. What, what we found, again, we went to the literature, Eastern, Western literature, and scientific literature, peer-reviewed scientific literature, took every study that we could find related to Chernobyl, including our own, where they measured radiation levels, where they measured some measure of genetic damage or damage to tissue function, some physiological consequence or disease consequence, and they also looked at oxidative stress and antioxidants. And, and the basic conclusion from this study is that organisms that have lots of antioxidants or have some way to change how they allocate antioxidants are not affected by the radiation as much as the other organisms. The, but what this means is that there's, you know, as you probably all know, there are two main mechanisms of genetic damage related to radiation. One is direct effects where the the radiation breaks the chromosomes into pieces, single and double strand breaks. And the other is our indirect effects related to the ionization of water in the cell, increasing the, the chemical activity, reactivity of the cell, leading to damage to the DNA, to proteins, to cellular membranes, uh, and DNA repairability. What these data show is that it's probably this second, this latter mechanism that's playing a big role in many of the sorts of uh, morbidities that we see in Chernobyl and Fukushima. And I'm going to skip this since most of you aren't biologists, I'm sure. So what else do we see? So now we, we know that there's lots of genetic damage. Does it matter? Is this reflected in any other kinds of consequences for these organisms? And, and, uh, and you know, my, my, my PhD advisor used to tell me, start with the sexy stuff. So, so I'm going to tell you a story about the sperm and the birds. <laughs> the, uh, and and it's, it's relevant because, of course, uh, reproduction is one of the most significant things we do, right? There's two parts, there's two components of our individual fitness. One is, do we live long enough to reproduce? And secondly, do we actually reproduce? And the, 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 multiplicative, the multiplication of those two factors determines our fitness in an evolutionary in an evolutionary way. And, uh, and so if you're a male and you don't have any sperm, your fitness will be zero no matter how old you get to live to. And so anyway, uh, we decided to look at the male function of birds living in the more radioactive areas. And we found, much to our surprise, that uh, for up to 40% of the birds in the most radioactive areas in some years were completely sterile. They had no sperm or just a few uh, dead sperm. And, and when we thought about it, when we went back to the literature, it wasn't so surprising given what we know about the, the effects of medical radiation uh, to treat, for instance, prostate cancer, uh, often leads to part, uh, temporary or permanent sterility in humans. And so perhaps it wasn't so surprising to see this in birds. But it does appear that the birds are quite being quite affected by this. And this has some relevance to the last part of the story where we talk about population abundances. Um, the second thing, of course, when you think about radiation and, and what people talk about all the time, of course, is cancers that relate to radiation. This is because most of the work is human-centric, uh, centric, and, and cancers are deadly. 
cancers are easy to identify and measure, um, and, and so we, we tend to use that as an endpoint uh, in, in a lot of medical studies. But, but the truth is radiation has general effects beyond cancers, uh, affecting every aspect of individual performance. And this isn't surprising again uh, in that the you know, mutations that occur are randomly dis dispersed. And so they affect many different components of, of the individual. But we've looked, started to, we decided to look at the cancers and in, in, in the tumors in the animals as well and published this paper just a little while, a couple of years ago, summarizing many years of observations. And, and much to our, again, much to many people's surprise, uh, many of the animals in the more contaminated areas had tumors. And you just never see wild animals with tumors. Most wild animals do not live long enough you know, to, to have tumors show up. And of course, a wild animal with a tumor is unlikely to survive very long. And so the fact that we see many more with tumors in Chernobyl implies that there's probably many more than we ever see that have tumors. Uh, this, this is a great tit that you have around here, a big tumor around its eye. Oops. And uh, I guess it's just one picture of nasty tumors for today. That's enough. So anyway, many more tumors. Then we started looking at the broader radiation, human radiation literature, uh, going back to the atomic bomb survivors studies, of which there were quite a few. And one of the first things uh, that, that people noticed among the atomic bomb survivors were a very high incidence of cataracts in the eyes, even in children. And because the tissues, the cells that make up the lens of the eye, the stem cells, are very sensitive to radiation. And, and if they have a mutation, they're much less likely to be perfectly clear. And uh, this is fairly well documented. Started looking at it in the birds. And much, again, much to our surprise, much higher frequencies of cataracts in the birds uh, in the more radioactive areas. We've just published another paper uh, a few weeks ago where we repeated this experiment with rodents living in Chernobyl and found the same pattern of higher cataracts in the more radioactive areas. Uh, another, another observation from atomic bomb survivors was that there were clearly radiation effects on the developing embryo. Neurological tissues were particularly sensitive to the effects of radiation. Many of the children born to women who were, were affected by the atomic bombs who were pregnant had children with cognitive function uh, disabled, cognitive disabilities and smaller brains, and uh, sometimes dramatically smaller brains, but often statistically smaller brains. When we look at the birds, again, the birds in the areas of high contamination, about 5% smaller brains, and the birds with the smallest brains had about a 50% lower probability of surviving from one year to the next, implying that there were cognitive outcomes of this reduced brain size. Birds already have small brains, so every little bit counts. Uh, we, we've actually repeated this study with the, with the rodents, and the rodents in both Fukushima and Chernobyl see the same kinds of consequences. It's not just individuals uh, that are affected. Uh, we've started looking at broader community effects, ecosystem level effects. One of the first things we noticed while walking through the Red Forest, um, <laughs> apart from our Geiger counter going off scale, uh, was that uh, the leaf litter, you know, when you walk through the forest, you know, the leaf, the dead leaves from the previous year, you usually see some. What we were noticing is that in, very, in, in areas of high contamination, the leaf litter was actually thick and spongy, you know, in some areas. And in fact, this, this doesn't, you can't really see this photo very well, but this is part of the Red Forest where the trees were pushed over or fell over, killed by the radiation. They haven't, they didn't, at the time we started going there 15 years ago, they hadn't really decomposed, even 15 years later. And you know, where I live, if, you, if a pine tree falls on the ground, 10 years later it's mostly sawdust from ants and fungi and microbes. And so we were a little bit um, intrigued by this, so we did the experiments where we put out little bags of leaf litter all over the zone, high contamination, low contamination, and found that the decomposition rate was about half 
in the more contaminated areas. And of course, this has enormous implications for the ecosystem because this is the, where the nutrient recycling comes. It's from the microbial breakdown of the dead organic matter. And without that nutrient cycling, uh, the ecosystem will be broadly affected. And we, we've also noted effects on the growth rates of the trees that could be uh, in part related to this. And of course, the other issue that comes up is that uh, with all this leaf litter accumulating and other dead organic matter accumulating, this poses a very significant hazard because of the increased threats from fires, especially given that uh, global climate change is generating uh, uh, higher temperatures and longer drought periods and a higher probability of catastrophic fires in the area. This, we, we wrote a paper, it was published last spring before, before the season came out, and it was a simulation model concerning the potential impacts to human populations from the radioactivity being remobilized by forest fires. And it, it got a little bit of attention. And then, and then the forest fires started hitting Chernobyl last year. There were three major forest fires, including one that came through a very, very radioactive area. And, and so uh, a, a lot more interest in this issue at this point. The Chernobyl does not have, Ukraine is a very poor country and they have not the resources to, to invest in firefighting and, and the management of these forests. And so this, is, this remains a, a serious hazard for the rest of Europe and certainly for Ukraine. And of course, this is one story that BBC got right. Two minutes! You know, I, I'm obviously talking too much. Um, the, the, the one issue I really wanted to get to, I, I, I'm going to have to eat into some of Keith's time, I guess. But <laughs> you don't want to listen to Keith anyway. It's just bad news. No, uh, the, the, one of the main questions that, that's come up uh, over and over again, and it's been in the news uh, a lot the last few months, uh, is the suggestion of because Chernobyl has a fence around it and there's relatively little hunting, the plants and animals, it's been suggested that the, that the animals are thriving. That, you know, you see this on, on the news all the time. You see TV shows where the wolves are frolicking through the snow. And, and, uh, but there are no data. There are no data, uh, uh, rigorous data in support of this. Uh, until this one paper came out a few months ago, mysteriously from data that had actually been generated two decades ago, and a decade ago. Anyway, uh, we, we've set out to rigorously address this issue of whether or not radiation affects abundances and biodiversity. And we've done it by using uh, huge numbers of biotic inventories, so bird counts and mammal counts and insect counts, and some fancy multivariate statistics. And the, the short answer is that in Chernobyl, every, every group of organisms that we've looked at show major declines in the more radioactive areas compared to the clean areas. These are the latest results for Fukushima, surveying for the last four years, five years. Again, dramatic and increasing declines in the numbers of birds in the more radioactive areas. And, and the, the picture is even stronger when you look at diversity. This is the probability of finding, uh, well, th these are the actual observations of numbers of species at a given point in space and time. Dramatic, dramatic impacts on the biodiversity. Uh, we just published a paper a couple months ago where we actually reconstructed the actual doses that these birds were getting. For the first time, nobody has ever done this before. We collaborated with a, with a group in, in France who specialize in this. And, um, and the basic findings are that when we reconstruct the doses for the birds, most of the birds get a dose above which is known to affect reproduction based on traditional health physics models. So it's not at all surprising that we see dramatic impacts on these populations. It's consistent with what we know about the effects. And here is just the sort of the summary model showing the drop off in predicted abundances versus the dose. And, and again, note that it is a rather straight line with relatively tight confidence bars with no evidence of any kind of threshold below which there's no effect. Um, so the bottom line really is that 
Chernobyl is certainly not a haven for wildlife. There, there are probably more game animals in the zone than outside of the zone simply because there's no hunting, but there's certainly no reason to think that they're not being affected by the radiation uh, directly. We, again, repeated measures of that. And there's certainly, and again, this is a paper that just came out last week, and there's absolutely no evidence that any of these animals are evolving adaptations to better tolerate the radiation. There's a few bacteria that might be, but none of the other animals are. All right, and let me just finish my, with this summary that, you know, basically, contrary to what the UN reports have suggested, um, there really is an abundance of scientific data now to suggest that there are strong and predictable effects of radiation on wild populations uh, and that uh, the effects appear to be proportional to the dose as you'd expect and there's no evidence of a threshold. Why isn't there more research being done on these questions? Uh, you know, that, that maybe it's not important. Maybe, maybe animal studies aren't so interesting. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, we think there should be uh, some kind of increased funding like everybody. But, uh, but we think more importantly, uh, this kind of a research effort should be led by independent scientists who are not connected to the industry or the regulatory organizations, which really has never happened before. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much.